Hi, my name is Paul Grogan and welcome to episode 30 of the Gaming Rules podcast, where I talk about the games that I've been playing and other things that I've been up to. This episode is later than normal because I got ill. I rarely get ill, managed to fight off most colds and things, but a week or so ago I got hit by a sickness fever thing which knocked me for six, pretty much incapacitated me for about four days. It's also not the kind of ill where I could just lounge around at home watching TV. I was in a right state, so pretty much everything stopped. I couldn't really do anything. I'm recovering now, but my head's still a bit cloudy and I'm still feeling quite weak and needing to sleep a lot. But the worst of it is over and I'm trying to get on with things. So in the last week, the nominations took place for the Golden Geek Awards 2016. And this podcast has received enough people voting for it that it actually made it through to become a Golden Geek nominee, which was a bit of a surprise, a very pleasant surprise. So thanks to everybody who voted for it. Looking at the other podcasts on the list, there's a lot of very good ones up there. So it's great to be included with those. Thanks as always to the sponsors of the show, Games Law, the UK's largest specialist games retailer at gameslaw.com. Guest. Right, so something a little bit different this week. I'm actually having the special guest part of the show uh, on first because my guests are also joining me for the What Paul Has Played section later on. And yes, I said guests because this week I'm joined by Joel and Tom from the Devon Dice podcast. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Hello. Hello. Thank you for having us. That's all right. So regular listeners of the show may have heard me mention Tom and Joel before and that's because they're good friends of mine and part of one of my local gaming groups. But that's not the reason why I've invited them on the show. I don't just invite random friends on. Uh, The reason is that Joel and Tom have recently started their own podcast known as Devon Dice. So tell us a bit about the podcast and what you're doing with it. Take it away, Joel. Oh, thank you. And so I used to do a podcast uh, for the last two years called uh, Ministry of Board Games. And Tom was talking to me and he started showing some interest in uh, like doing some shows for me. And then we got discussing of what we could do and everything. And then it kind of rolled into that. Oh, let's just restart. Let's have a fresh start and new name, new podcast and just re-ramp it. So it's basically the same format as I used to do. We talk about games we played. We talk about news and Kickstarter. Um, But then we introduced some new things where we got um, a discussion of topic uh, that we bring up. Just talk about something. And then we also have something that I call bonus content, which is going to turn into probably more like reviews of games. Um, So we've been starting to try and do um, top 10 reviews of the board game Geek, the top 10 of that. And we've done the first one and we've done a whole episode on it. This top 10 thing that you're doing is, is over the whole of this year, is that right? Yes, in many ways. Yes. So you're sort of drip feeding it in. Yeah, the original idea was to do one a month, uh, try and give ourselves enough time to give them a whole chunk of good plays. Because uh, we figured, well, top 10 board game geek must be good games. Uh, we, hadn't, we hadn't necessarily played them all. So when did you set the top 10? So we set the top 10 back in November. Something around that, yeah. <laughs> so sometime at the end of last year was, was when you drew the line and said, right, the top 10 as it was then... We're now going to do a proper review of each one of them and yep. dedicate an episode to each one. We've done one and it was um, Android Netrunner and we've done a whole episode on it and it went on for an hour and a half and it was a good episode. I craft, I thought I crafted something nice together, but even listening to myself and getting feedback from people, it was too long, it was too boring. Well, not too, it was kind of boring in the sense of just listening to someone or a few people talking about a game for that length of time. So we're now going to condense it and squeeze it into our regular show and try and keep it to 15 minutes probably um, and really just focus on the strong elements and maybe the bad elements we didn't like about the game and give our opinion like that. So the regular show is now just going to be twice a month yeah. as normal with yeah. this hopefully once a month would be trying to look at at least one game from the top 10 um, and then possibly uh, some other review games because we've got the gallerist coming up that we're going to do um, and then possibly there's some things in the works and we can't discuss it yet because <laughs> it's not been cleared up yet but okay but you've also got a blog as well on your on your website which is devondice.co.uk that's right I, I, I started doing a blog um, there's one there at the moment 
and they have every intention to continue doing those. They're kind of exploring ideas around board games and rather than looking at uh, uh, reviews of board games, the idea is to look at what types of board games there are, and more specifically what types of board gamers there are and whether there are, exploring the idea, whether or not different board, uh, board gamers are uh, kind of prone or can understand what it is that draws them to the games they like. Right. And if there's some commonalities to that between people, then by understand people understanding that better and being framed in that way, they're more likely to be able to be directed to come across and enjoy the games that they're uh, most interested in and most likely to uh, chime with. Okay. And you've also got a guild over on Board Game Geek as well? Uh, yeah, I mean, everyone's got to have one there. Um, it's not, not much happened yet. <laughs> uh, if you want to go along and join, it's guild number 2414. Uh, it's Devon Dice again. Um, I mean, I mainly like using Facebook. We've got a Facebook page of uh, Devon Dice. Uh, I put stuff up there. If I come across anything interesting, board game related, I will post it there. Um, uh, Twitter, we've got Twitter as well. Same thing. Uh, and our blog will have everything, like the podcast will be put there. Tom's blog will be put there. And also, hopefully, me and Lewis Holt, um, which gets he gets mentioned a few times here. He's possibly going to guest with us on our podcasts um, now and then. We're trying to do uh, video uh, gameplays through Tabletopia, um, and we're just working on that. We've done a few. We've test recorded a few bits, and um, yeah, we're just we're working out a few kinks and just trying to work with it at the minute. So okay. they might pop up soon, hopefully as well on YouTube. So. So the best place for people to get hold of you is probably the Facebook page then? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Devin Dice. Yeah, or Twitter. Yeah. Or Twitter, everyone. Uh, Joel and I are quite active on Twitter. Joel especially. Try to be, yeah. So yeah, Devon Dice, it's uh, kind of, yeah, some something that's grown out of what Joel's been doing for the last couple of years. You've now joined it, giving it something new and fresh. And uh, yeah, it's all exciting times ahead. Yeah, it's, it's really good. Um, it's very new. We're looking at pumping out a lot of content and we're really excited about it. Hopefully, with all those different angles, um, we can produce some stuff uh, that people like to listen to. And we've been getting some really great feedback so far on the podcasts. Um, there's quite a lot of humour involved and we're always bouncing off each other. Um, so, yeah, go and check it out. Excellent. Okay, well, that's that's all for this section. So uh, thanks, for, thanks for joining me on this part of the show and I'll talk to you in a bit. See you then. See ya. What Paul has played. So the first game I want to talk about is an old game that I picked up back in 1999. And a friend of mine, Robert, came round one evening and there was only him. So we got out some two-player games. And I remember Kahuna as being a really great old two-player game that I had. So we got it out. Uh, I then played it again the week afterwards with you, Tom. And then I played it online with um, Brandon from the What Did You Play This Week podcast thing. And yeah, Kahuna, really good old game. What did you think of it, Tom, when you played it? It really surprised me. Um, I very much enjoyed it, and yeah, we had a good game of it. Um, it, it it's got a lot of um, a lot of good tactics to it, but it's in a nice little neat package uh, that you can play quite quickly. Obviously, two player, um, uh, but you're drafting the cards to allow you to put your little bridges out, and then there's a cool little mechanic that effectively allows you to destroy other people's bridges. Yeah, when you put enough into into a specific island, and that gives this interplay backwards and forwards. You can see what the other person's drafting, um, what they might be going for, and and build around that. So, yeah, a very uh, it, it's almost it's certainly abstract, um, but a, a really strong implementation of a two player abstract game. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's definitely abstract. You're playing cards to build bridges between the islands. When you've got the majority of bridges on an island, you gain control of that island and it knocks off your opponent's bridges that were connected to that island. That's basically how you play the game. But as, as you say, Tom, there's the, ah, oh, you've picked up the, uh, the Lale card, right. Okay, so now I know you've got that in your hand. I need to plan accordingly. So the, there, is a, there is, even though there's card draw in it, there's a lot of skill and strategy in it. It's just really nice. It's in the Cosmos two-player games, but it's one of the better ones, I think. Yeah, really enjoyed it. Next game I wanted to talk about that I've played is another game of 504, which I've been itching to play for weeks now, just because I want to delve deeper and explore a bit more. And we played, there were three of us, and we played, what was it? It was 815, 
which is a world I've not played before. I am trying to only play new worlds, which is sometimes a little unfair on new players to the game, but I always say to them beforehand, look, we're going to try a new world. It might not work. Don't be put off from the game if this particular combination doesn't work. But we played 815, and 815 caught me out a bit because the module 8 on the top means that you're trying to build plants which produce goods and then you sell those goods at your trading posts which is how you get victory points okay the middle module is how you generate money and normally in all of the other games that i played those two things are normally separate so in in 615 for example you're building roads to get victory points but you're transporting goods to make money and you need the money to buy more people etc etc with 815 you're transporting the goods to make money. So all of a sudden, you're transporting the goods to make money and victory points. And it just changed the focus. And it was a very, it was an interesting game, but it was like, it was like some of the other games. You get sort of a third of the way through and then you go, ah, right, I now see what we was trying to do. Now, neither of you to have played 504 yet, but you've heard me go on about it quite a bit. So what's your, what's your own opinions on it? Well, um, it looks like a really fascinating idea, isn't it? You've got all these different nine modules that can be mixed and matched and depending on where they go completely changes the game experience. But it scares me a little bit because I'm quite a completionist and I'm not sure I could handle knowing that there's <laughs> another 500, another 499, another 498 worlds to play. Yeah. Um, and you're saying about the, uh, it caught you out a little bit. Is that something that happens as yeah. a result of the rules? Not uh, the kind of part way through you realise how the rules worked uh, in that you got a rule wrong or is it more to do with like similar to Dominion where you kind of halfway through the game you go oh that's how this set of 10 cards works together and those two yeah. work together yeah. well yeah that's it I've played module 8 before I've played module 1 before I know how each of those modules work on their own in different positions I've never played 8-1 something and it was the combination of 8 in the top position and 1 in the middle position which which threw me and for you know the guy who hadn't played any of the worlds before once i'd sort of struggled and worked out and thought oh i see right and then explained it to him he was okay because he was going into it for the first time whereas i'm i'm used to you know delivering goods for either victory points or money and, and not both so it just it just threw me a bit so yeah it's, it's not the rules really it's just how the different modules combine together and the impact that 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 has it certainly means that the game's got well, a lot of replayability, but is it replayability because you're not actually playing the same game again? Anyway, mm. interesting, interesting. So we'll have to get it get it on you at some point and give it give it yeah, a go. Yeah, I, I would like to. As I say, it does scare me a bit, and it it looks a bit bland, doesn't it? They because there's no theme on it particularly, because they've had to put the 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 way the mechanics work together. It does look a little. It's not inviting in, but yeah, really fascinated by the concept of it. I'm not biting at the bit to get at this game. Um, it doesn't really, it's not pulling me in. All I see is it's a box of mechanics. Um, it is. It's, a, it's, it's an abstract game, effectively. Yeah, and it's it's not doing that for me. I, I, I don't know. I need, I like games that come with a bit of theme. You'll see that with the game we're going to talk about. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just, you get it out all the time and like, who wants to play? And I, I'm not rushing there. Now, if it's the last seat going and there's nothing else going on in the game group, then I'll take the seat out and I'll play it and probably I will like it. But uh, it's that I need to be kind of actually pushed into the river to to do that, to learn to <laughs> swim, basically. So, um, yeah, that's my opinions on 504. Cool. Um, the other game I wanted to talk about was Matainai, um, which is a culturedic game that I really wanted to like. And spoiler, I, I, I don't really. Um, I've tried it about 10 times now, and I thought, is this the culture it game that I'm going to like? A simple version of Glory to Rome, which I wasn't too keen on anyway, maybe that was the hint. Now, I've played this game, as I say, about 10 times. I've played it with about eight or so different people. Nobody seems really taken by it, but I know there's big fans of it out there. I think the majority of people that do like it probably like a lot of other Carl Chudik games. And as I say, I, I've not really taken to any of his other games. Um, now, Joel, I know you've played this one because I think I taught you how to play it. Uh, well, yeah, the only time I have played it is against you. Um, right. And I kind of like it. 
I played Glory to Rome, but we played it as a four player and it was just chaos. Um, yeah. This was, it felt more controlled in a way. Um, I liked certain aspects of it and I like certain things like, okay, I play this card, it gives me this benefit or the power, which then you, f- the other person thinks, oh, that's so overpowering kind of thing. But then you go through, the other person goes through their card, oh, I can play this now, which counteracts that. Which yeah. is that kind of thing. I kind of like something to counteract again if you get the right card at the right time. Um, and if you don't, you, that could be very swingy. Um, yeah. But uh, so there is there is some, uh, there's some good bits. And I like how the cards do multiple things. Um, and there's, this, there's, there's a little bit complex bit of the scoring at the end. Um, yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit fiddly. I mean, you yeah. were saying about the cards with the abilities. Mm. That that for me is yeah. There's lots of cards with cool abilities, so cool things can happen in the game. And when when a couple of those cards maybe combo together, mm. possibly and create something a bit weird. Yeah, but I just found it was pretty random whether whether you get them or not. So it's like, you know, I played one game where somebody went, oh, I'll play this, and as you say, it seemed really overpowered. Yeah, and then it was like, oh right, well I'll, I'll now craft this, and that counters that. Yeah, that's we, that happened with us. Yeah, I, I, it was just total luck yeah. that I had that card. It wasn't due to any skill of mine, yeah. really. I just drew the card and I was able to craft it, and then and then it happened. So yeah, the some interesting things can happen in the game. Maybe there's a hidden skill level to it, but I think it's as I say, I've given it a good go, and yeah, not many people I know. A few people have said don't want to play it again, didn't like it, mm-hmm. and nobody's gone. Oh wow, this game's fantastic. We definitely need to play this again. So I've given it a good shot, and I'll probably uh, probably move on now. I think. So moving on from a game which I'm probably not going to play again, onto a game which I'm definitely going to play again, which is Orleans or Orleans or however you want to pronounce it. I've played this I think three times now, and it's just yeah, loving it. And me and you, Tom, played it recently. And uh, yeah, I, I've, I've, I've mentioned it on the podcast before, so I don't know how much detail to go into it, apart from we had a great game. That we did. This is smack bang in my wheelhouse, this one, Orleans. <laughs> and it was your first play <laughs> first of the game. First play of the game. It, so you can talk about it as, as your opinion. Sure. I mean, it, it, it's bag building, um, but I didn't really chime with a previous bag building game, Hyperborea. So I was a little bit apprehensive going into it that it was a bit of a problem. But because it's got simultaneous play of the tokens that you're pulling out, it just removes all of the kind of thinking about what to do with those chits once they've come out the bag. Um, And for me, it's kind of this lovely engine building, multiple paths to victory, um, role selection uh, framework. And I I just really enjoyed it. love to give it some more plays I, th- I think it's it's got a lot it's got a lot of legs yeah i mean i was um i, I was sort of umming and ahhing about the game you know last year and thinking oh should i should i get it or not i've got enough games and then yeah got given it as a sort of christmas gift from from games law and uh i'm very very happy that he did because i was like okay i didn't expect to enjoy this as much as i did it is is a really good game and as you say there does seem to be multiple paths to victory um i love the mechanics of it and yeah um just just everything about it so far i've not really explored the buildings and there's a few people that say oh this building is just you know no good whatsoever or this building is too good uh i haven't really looked into them i'm just i'm just sort of enjoying playing the game rather than analyzing Mm. it i mean i've come last last and next to last in all the games i've played (laughs) which is probably just because i'm I'm just enjoying playing the game. Yeah. I don't really know what I'm doing. I, I go in with an idea and it obviously doesn't work. Um, but yeah, there may be some balance queries about some of the buildings. Who knows? But yeah, very enjoyable game to play. And I think everybody who played it uh, on Tuesday really liked yeah, it. Yeah, and I think that's the thing with this game is that it's very much uh, that experience of playing it. I wonder, because it's quite static in the uh, paths to victory, you want to take it, you kind of almost decide at the beginning a bit which one you're going to go for, that if you did analyze it all and the buildings and the the which one was the best one and solve that puzzle you'd probably kind of or me if i've done that i've solved it i'd probably be done with it um but just keeping those ticks over enjoying it for what it is and the experience of it that's what gaming is about and and that this game delivers that in spades 
Yeah. Have you had a chance to play it yet, Joel? No, I want to. I mean, my favourite bag building game at the minute is automobiles and automobiles yeah this i've i think i could like this one i've seen video reviews of it and everything like that and uh, yeah i do want to give it a try just not had the chance yeah. not met up with you lot when you've had it out to play so yeah we, we always keep it for when you're not there. yeah i know <laughs> thanks so. now we did play with a house rule and i know some people don't like house rules in games at all but the last two times we played uh, this game there is there is the plague and for us the plague came out on turn two and what happened is one of the players around the table lost one of their people on turn two and it's a random draw uh, and that player ended up pretty screwed because on turn two you get an extra person and then he dies and you're screwed as you said there's an engine building element to the game so if you get if you get hampered right at the start of the game on building your engine by what you've just done getting taken away from you, then you are a bit screwed. Now, there are things that you can do in the game to mitigate that. You can choose only to put your own starting people back in the bag, but that's basically then you, you deliberately choose to hamper yourself in order to not be hurt by the plague. And what I found most people do is they take a bit of a risk and it's generally either a one in three or a one in four chance that you're gonna lose somebody, which is fine, but when one of the players in the table is unlucky and gets gets stitched early on, we looked at the scores from those two games and the player who did get stitched by the plague ended up doing a lot, you know, less well than the other players. So, a friend of mine, Mark, came up with an idea for a house rule, which I thought was a great idea. And what it is, is when the plague is drawn, the starting player draws something out of the bag, exactly like they would do normally, but only the starting player. And that determines whether the players collectively lose something out of the bag or not. So rather than it be a random chance for each player to lose something, which naturally hurts some and favours others, it will be basically whether, whether somebody dies or not is determined by one player. So what we did is the starting player drew a token out of the bag. If it was their own person, then the safe, everybody's, everybody's okay, nobody dies. If that person draws... Um, you know, another worker thing out of the bag. That means the plague has hit and somebody dies. And then each player then pulls something out of the bag un until they get one that dies. I felt that worked very well and it removed that. Uh, the, the random element was still in there and there was still a little bit of skill because if the plague did hit and you only had your own people in the bag, then you were unaffected by it. So that, that sort of skill or, or, you know, strategy that you can take to avoid it is still there but it meant that when it did hit it affected all players relatively equally yeah i mean it seemed to make sense to me because the game didn't feel like it needed that random element of uh one player or uh, many players gaining over a single player who happens to get punished um and certainly because uh, probably when they come up at the e towards the end of the game, losing one token from your bag isn't the end of the world. But if it happens in the first few turns and you're the only one or you're the only two or four or whatever who get hit by it, it I can see that being an unnecessary big difference. Um, so it seems like a sensible uh, house rule to me uh, to get around that. I would be really interested to hear from someone else or the designer, for example, if there was some reason that we haven't spotted why it was in there but seemed it seemed perfectly sensible to me and it, it seemed to work really well yeah i mean it worked fine those people who don't like house rules or don't think it's a problem fine they, they don't have to do it but uh, i did speak to somebody last week who went oh no 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 it's not a problem and it was like and i said have you ever had the situation where the plague came out on turn two and one player lost the character that they've just done and then ended up coming last no that's never happened to us right well, there you go then. So, <laughs> you know, the house rule is in there not to fix a massive problem with the entire game, but just to fix something that has actually happened now in every single game that I've played. I, you know, the chance of the plague coming out on turn two is three in 17, but it's happened in the last three games. So, you know, it's, it's very odd. Anyway, moving on, we then played Elysium, which is another game which... I, it was just a great night at the club. We all played Orleans and I think everybody loved it. And then we played Elysium and I think everybody loved that as well. Um, and I've talked about this on the podcast before, but Elysium is now in there in the list of games which I, I definitely do want to play more. Mm. Yeah, and this one rewards additional plays as well, doesn't it? Have you played it, Joel? Yeah, yeah, I played it a few times. I beat Paul. 
I don't know if that, I, don't, oh. I don't know if that's a, a achievement or nothing, but it was very close. <laughs> um, so yeah. Uh, yeah, I played it a few times, so I, I really enjoy this one as well. Yeah, I mean, we played with a basic set of cards because there was a couple of new players, um, but there's a guy at our local club that commented, and I think I overheard him saying that he now doesn't play at all ever with the Hermes cards because he was saying that things can get completely out of control, which is what I talked about on my podcast, oh, God knows how long ago now, when we first played it and everything did go completely and utterly out of control. So... Um, yeah, it was interesting to hear what what David was saying about uh, about the Hermes cards. I do need to. I want to. I want to play them because I want to sort of mix things up like you do with Dominion. You don't always want to play with the starting ten cards all the time. But I will keep that in the back of my mind that things can get a bit crazy with them. Hermes, which ones that? I presume they're the ones that allow you to re-trigger things and that kind of stuff. Right. It's possibly what happened in one of your games. It's what happened hey. in the very first game that we played. <laughs> where yeah, because you normally score. I don't know. I can't remember how many actual victory points you normally score, but it's not that high. Oh, I see. Actual victory point counters. No, no, it's not. It's not that many, is it? And and we ended up scoring about 90 each or something. I mean, we, we broke the bank halfway through the game and ended up having to use also. It was just a crazy game. And um, yeah, that was interesting. It's a good game. It's got a lot of text on the cards. That, that was kind of the one downside for the new players it was like right here's 13 cards at the start of epoch one you've got to read them all and learn what they do and then epoch two here's another 13 cards but you know the artwork the graphic design the gameplay it's just full of lots of really challenging micro decisions i like i really like the the um currency and the way in it that you've got the four columns of different colors and you can only purchase cards of those col- those colors but you can discard any colour you want. Any, of yeah. It. And I really like that rule because that really makes you think, okay, what do I want? What do I want to buy in the future? What can't yeah. they get kind of thing? You're really concentrating on what other people are doing. Maybe a little bit too much sometimes, but yeah, you're, you're constantly watching what the opponents are doing and what they can't get and what they can get. So, Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a really good. It's got, for me, the perfect balance of I'm doing this for myself, but ah, I need to watch... Tom over there because he's got a red and a yellow mm. left so I'm thinking what he's going to do next therefore I'll do this yeah it's, it's, mm. it's really good it's not direct conflict in a way but it's very interactive in as you say looking at what the other people have, uh, have been doing Yeah. so that's about it for what I've been playing what have you two been playing? well I picked up um, a game off of Amazon because it was so cheap it was unbelievable and it's called Sons of Anarchy Men of Mayhem from is that ID... a TV show? yes it is from right, IDW okay. Games um, and yeah it's based on a TV show which I've never watched and neither has Tom but we got the game straight away we, we sat down and played it last night four of us and I mean Tom was in love with it straight away and I was enjoying myself. And it is uh, worker placement, Tom? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's like listening to my wife, isn't it? Telling me what I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, why did you get this game then? If you've not watched the TV series, you just did you hear it was good? I have heard some some stuff. It was Everyone was saying it's, a, it's an all right game uh, for what it is and things like that. And it was cheap on Amazon. So I thought, well, okay, let's just have a look. Let's play it. See what it's like. If it's rubbish, I'll get rid of it. If it's good, I'll keep it. And it's no. But it's not problem. rubbish. It is it's good. Not, is it? No. it is good. You'll love it, Tom, uh, Paul. It's right up your street. It's got yeah. dice rolling for some outcomes, and right. it's got um, blind bidding. <laughs> oh, fantastic! My, my two favourite things. <laughs> yeah, it's, re- <laughs> it's made for you. Oh, right. It comes together as a nice package. It's 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 a bit of a fun bit of area control bit of trading bit of kind of backwards and forwards between the players and mm. banter um and and it's but you've still got control i mean you're rolling dice and it's it's the you know highest score wins but you can augment the scores and it feels like they've got a good balance it doesn't all come down to the dice you can mm. totally mitigate it if you play that way but it does have those random elements which doesn't chime with everyone yeah but it's a fun little romp of a game so neither of you have watched the tv series so i can't no. obviously ask you you know how true to the tv series is the game but clearly you don't need to have seen the tv series to enjoy no. the game no not really i mean it, the basic aim of it is to earn the most money 
you're a biker gang, primary, um, and like Hell's Angels, things like that. They've got the members that ride around on the bikes, and you've got um, uh, prospects, which are just uh, apprentices, up and coming members. Um, and you've got your clubhouse, which is your home board. And you're basically trying to go out and make as much money as possible. And you can do that by selling drugs um, and then selling guns or buying guns and selling guns um, and things like that. Okay. So why is it why was it going cheap on Amazon? Did it not sell well or is it just a, a cheap, a cheap game? Is there not much in the box? I think it's probably on the cheaper end of games anyway. Okay. Mm. Um, but then it, it, it didn't. I don't think it sold loads and loads. It didn't kind of break through. It's it's a game that you know, as I say, I really enjoyed it. It was it was something that set up a, a place upon which we could have that experience. Mm-hmm. But it's definitely not the kind of game that's for everyone. And yeah. perhaps that meant that there were plenty of gamers who'd watch reviews and kind of just made that choice that they didn't think it was for them. Right. It's probably the IP as well. I mean, it's a it's a big TV series. I can think they got three or four series out on it. But okay. I don't know many people that watch it personally. I mean, I, we haven't. Um, I might sit down and watch it now, give it a try. But if the IP's not there for everyone, like they've done Firefly before, so that sell, sold like hotcakes and keeps selling yeah. like hotcakes. This is not so big an IP, um, so it's not going to sell as well. It's only going to sell if people give it good reviews. Um and it only came out at Gen Con last year. So I was going to say it's a it's a pretty recent game for it to be mm. cheap on Amazon. Only a, you know less than a year after it came out. But as you say, I guess if it if it didn't sell that well, the publisher sat there with a few thousand copies in the warehouse. Just mm. go right there, you go. Yeah. You know, let's get rid of it somehow. But then and, it's um, it's probably just Amazon because they got they probably buy tons of lots of stuff, and then at some point say we've got too much of this left over. Quick, put it up cheap, right. get rid of it. Quick turnaround, yeah, we get more stock in of something else. Yeah. yeah. Well, it it enabled you guys to have a to have a fun game, which you sound mm. sounds like one I'll avoid like the plague. But um, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll bring it to each to the so can play. Yeah, yeah, bring, yeah, bring it, bring it round. <laughs> we'll play it after Talisman, Paul. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> so and on that note, it's time to wrap things up. So thanks very much for joining me on the show, guys, and um, good luck with the the Devon Dice, and I hope it does well. Yeah, oh, it's thank been you, an Paul. absolute pleasure. Thanks, Paul. I'll see you soon. Yeah. Cheers, bud. Bye. Gaming Rules News. Now, before I got ill, I was still busy working away on the Sulkin video for CGE, which would have been finished by now if it weren't for all of the problems last week. But I'm aiming to crack on with that as soon as I get back from my trip to the Czech Republic, and I'm due to travel out at about three o'clock in the morning tomorrow. I've got to get to the airport in time, uh, flying from uh, Bristol to Amsterdam, and then Amsterdam on to Prague. So every year, about this time, CG have an event which, call, which is called Czech Gaming. Now, it isn't just a normal gaming event. What it is, is their opportunity to basically play test and develop all of their new games that are going to be coming out this year and potentially future years. So I think this is the fourth time I've been and I always really enjoy it. It is work. You know, we are there heavily developing these games, talking about them testing them over and over again. Um, I'm a little nervous about going away because as I say, I'm still not fully recovered yet. And I do have to get up at three o'clock in the morning to get to the airport. Um, But it is something that I I definitely don't want to miss. So I'll be going away to that soon. Um, I've also been to Paris a couple of weeks ago, uh, working with the guys from Mythic Battles. Now, Mythic Battles is a game which is going to be launched on Kickstarter later this year. It's actually Mythic Battles Pantheon, because it's based on an old game called Mythic Battles. And I went out there for the day uh, to basically learn how to play the game to start writing the script and storyboard for the video that I'm going to be working on. I don't have any deadlines or dates for that yet. It's just going to be sometime later on this year. And I've also been doing a bit of rulebook work for various companies, Portal Games, Space Cowboys, and various other bits and bobs. As I say, just trying to trying to get back into things now and doing all of the preparation for the events coming up later on this year. So that's everything for Podcast 30. Thanks again to the sponsors of the show and to Jason Shaw at audionautics.com for the music used in this podcast. Take care and thanks for listening. <laughs>